Welcome everyone to our National Science Week conversation with our Chief Metrologist Bruce Warrington and Australia's Astronomer at Large Fred Watson. Today we're going to be talking about this incredibly important curious topic of what time is it on the Moon? Now in preparation for this event I've been looking into a few things and I've learned the Moon is about 384,000 kilometres away from us on average. It's around one light second away which is about how long it takes this, the, an object to travel at the speed of light to get there. So to answer this question of what time is it on the moon, we've got Bruce Warrington, chief metrologist, who works in an area of measurement science, which is essential to helping us understand how long, how big, and how far away things are. And also Fred Watson, who is an astronomer at large and well accustomed to years of research in the far outer reaches of the universe. So let's get stuck into this question. From your perspectives, just to warm us up, why is it even important that we know the time on the moon? Who wants to go first? So you know what time the bus is going to come. <laughs> uh, but it, it is. It's all about synchronising events, isn't it? It's, uh, it's about making sure that people do the right thing at the right time. If you're going to be due uh, at the front door of your space capsule at 9.30, that's when you've got to be there. And so you've got to have a time zone uh, and a time system. Um, but uh, I'm really interested in Bruce's thoughts on this as well, because he looks at time, I think, from a little bit different way from me, apart from the fact that there's about 150 <laughs> years between us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you, Fred. I think, so, um, we might, the, if we think about uh, the right time for something, it probably doesn't matter too much if we're a little bit late or a bit early for an appointment, but some of the really complex systems that we rely on in our everyday lives actually require really tight synchronization to work, and that's going to be even more true in space. Um, a really good example is mobile phone signals. In order for you to have a, a call hand over from one cell to another as you move, the, the clocks in the two different cells have to be synchronized at the level of millionths of a second. And those, com those complications about systems needing to work together and synchronize and communicate over even bigger distances just get bigger as you go further into space. So I'm thinking on the scale of my daily commute, where I know my phone signal drops out at several points along the way and might take you know, half a minute sometimes to connect. What could possibly go wrong when you've got such complex missions as space, space missions happening? Um, certainly your signal could drop out uh, at the distance of the moon. But uh, I'm just sort of imagining, you know, a situation where you've got astronauts walking on the moon, maybe taikonauts and, cos and uh, cosmonauts as well, uh, who are essentially trying to arrange how their wo daily work is going to take place. So if you're going to have a, uh, a time system that is broadcast by radio, uh, then you need to make sure that everybody's radio signals are arriving at the right time. And because, as exactly as Bruce says, we're talking about intervals of millions of a second making a difference. This takes you into the depths of physics. Uh, it means that you've got to take into account things like relativity, which says that time operates slower in a gravitational field than it does outside a gravitational field. Or, for example, if you've got a satellite going around the moon trying to synchronize these things, that the motion of that satellite also needs to be taken into account or else it will change the time. So it, it's, it, it, it's a problem that uh, maybe it looks simple on the surface. Oh yeah, we just give everybody in the moon the same time as probably what we call universal time on Earth, which is the sort of the, the basic time standard and everybody else's time zones are related to that. Maybe uh, we would think uh, naively that you could just have universal time running on the moon, but because of all the uh, all these subtleties, uh, that could be a disaster if you've got equipment that needs millionth of a second resolution. So, how are we going to address that? It's up to him. <laughs> <and his guys. laughs> so it it starts with clocks, and it starts with an understanding of how those clocks work in those different environments, as Fred has said. So you have to start by understanding that time does tick at a different rate on the moon to how it does on Earth, and you have to allow for that. We already have to account for those shifts in operation on Earth. So a GPS satellite um, only, the, the GPS navigation system essentially works by timing. You're triangulating how long signals took to get to you to know where you are. 
So we already have to set the clocks wrong on Earth so that they tick at the right rate in space. We're going to have to do that even more carefully in an environment like the Moon, where those shifts are bigger and more complicated uh, with relative motion as well. So you're painting a picture for me here that time is going to be really quite different on the Moon, which maybe wasn't so much of an issue when we were just stopping for a little while, but could be a pretty big issue when we're going to have manned missions to the moon and people possibly staying there for longer periods of time. Um, from a first person perspective, if you're on the moon, you're, you're an astronaut, cosmonaut, and you're, you're there, um, how does this play out in real life for you? Uh, it's astonishingly different um, because we on Earth naturally relate time to the rotation of the Earth once every 24 hours. Um, and that makes the progression of time something that even though you no, might not be conscious of it, it's all about the sun going across the sky. That's how we told time in, the, in, in olden times with a, with a sundial. Uh, on the moon, um, the, effectively the length of the day is 29 and a half days of our days. So you don't have that natural progression of, of time passing. Um, and so if you're on the moon, and this is what has happened in the past with astronauts on the moon. You impose on the, on the moon the time zone from Earth so that they regulate their daily activity, their sleep patterns and things of that sort by Earth time because there's nothing natural on the moon that's dictating that. So it is a very different environment. I think it's a little bit, I'm just imagining what it could be like, a bit like being on the, the, at the North Pole or the South Pole or above yeah. the Arctic yeah. Circle, for example, where the sun never sets at particular times and adjusting to what that feels like um, using, as you say, a clock reference that's not got a, a natural uh, reminder to it. And particularly as more and more missions go to the moon and more and more missions are cooperating in different parts of the moon, then uh, using different parts of the day with that one common clock becomes more challenging. And I imagine it's also more complicated by the fact that, although I did say at the beginning it's about 384,000 kilometres from Earth on average, we do know that that distance from Earth, or the distance between Earth and the Moon really varies up to over 400,000 kilometres. Yeah. So, you know, that to me makes it even more complex. Is that the case? Is, is this sort of changing um, distance from Earth and the way we communicate between Earth and our future bases on the Moon, um, how, how will that be impacted? Um, well, uh, you're absolutely right. The distance to the of the Moon from the Earth changes by 14%. That's that's the and, and it's quite significant. Uh, so, if you were relying on signals synchronized from Earth, then that has to be taken into account because it's you know it's not just 1.3 seconds anymore it's 1.3 in a lot of decimal places uh, but they're all different so and that's changing all the time as the as the moon revolves around the earth so y y that is clearly something that you need to compensate for the good news is that we know the distance of uh, the earth from the moon or the other way around the moon from the earth to about a centimeter and so, um, the, you know, the, the, the length of time it takes light to travel a centimetre is not very big. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it means that you can, you can very accurately make those synchronisations because we know the separation accurately. Yeah, I think the, the, one of the bigger challenges potentially, and this is one that scientists are starting to think about right now, is the, the lunar equivalent of GPS on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, we are so used to, use, to relying on GPS every day for easy navigation to wherever we're going. There is no equivalent to that on the moon, and it will be needed as more and more missions and, and uh, more and more people occupy that space. So early thoughts about how that will be designed, how it will operate, and what time reference it will use are, are in play right now. So I was wondering, thinking of this idea of, um, you know, GPS equivalent for the surface of the moon, mm. um, when we have multiple bases on, on moon spread around different locations, are we going to have, do you think, one time zone for the whole moon? Is that possible? Or, or will it actually be a bit like Earth where we've got a range of them spread fairly evenly around the surface? I actually think because of the, the moon's rotation is so slow and nothing really changes on, on the scale of a day that you could do it with one mm -hmm. time zone uh, on the moon. You'd have that basically the Earth would be at different heights in the sky f from different bases on the moon, but 
um, that daily, that diurnal cycle uh, doesn't occur. Um, I think contracts for GPS systems on the moon are already being mm -hmm. let, aren't they? So it's not some. This is not pie in the sky. Uh, but it, it, the laws of physics are sufficiently well understood that. Um, I, I don't think that would give any rise to problems. The basic problem is getting from one place to another. Uh, the moon's terrain doesn't have motorways on it uh, or anything <laughs> equivalent. And in fact, really, the, the, the way to get from one base to another on the moon is going to be to go back into space and then come back down again, probably. Just to stick with this for a little bit, I think one of the big questions about the, the reference time is going is already, will it be something which is still synchronized closely to Earth or will it be a, a genuinely lunar time zone with its own set of clocks synchronized and, and knowing the difference between what time is on the moon and time to the Earth? So far, as we've touched on very briefly, We've projected Earth time yeah. on moon <coughs> missions by synchronizing um, spacecraft clocks back to Earth. Will that still be true when we are more and more at the moon? So that's a really great point. And are we going to have new types of instrumentation that, we, that are going to be specialized to the particular conditions of the, the time telling on the moon? Uh, it's a really good question. I think. Uh, you never know until you go there. <laughs> but um, a lot of the fundamental technologies um, are well understood. So how to make a clock that survives in space conditions, the, the radiation environment or the vacuum environment and so on. Clocks which are as robust as possible that will have a long life. Um, however, there's such a long history of exploration and navigation driving improvements in mm. timekeeping that goes back for hundreds of years in our human history and I'm sure it will be true into the future. So we might have lunar horologists who just specialise oh, yeah. in I, I would developing apply. Where, where do I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm putting you at top yeah. of this. So is it still the strontium lattice clock that's the most accurate uh, timekeeper in the world? Well, timekeepers like to compete yes. about uh, which system is the best. Uh, <laughs> basically, the world's most accurate clocks use atoms and the particular properties of atoms as their reference for the most stable and accurate time. And different kinds of atomic system have different strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the decisions that the Earth timekeepers have to make is how would we define the second better into the future? It's currently yeah. defined with reference to cesium, yeah. but we're already much better than that in laboratory-based clocks, including strontium. Yeah. Interesting. This is painting a marvellous picture of a really technologically <laughs> different future as well for those on the moon. I can imagine them thinking slightly differently about uh, how humankind might keep going beyond the edges of the moon. But I have a going back to the question of the GPS system. And I mm. have this vision, and correct me if I'm wrong, of the moon being surrounded by geostationary um, satellites or orbiting satellites. What does, does that look different to a GPS array here on Earth? I think it would. Uh, sorry. Well, it, they wouldn't be geostationary, they'd be lunar stationary. Of course, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and it's actually not that the, um, the GPS spacecraft aren't geostationary, they're in low or orbit, and you need a lot of them. So that would be one thing that would happen, you know, as, assuming that there was a perceived need and perhaps the international cooperation that might be needed to put it to put together a GPS system on the moon. You, you're going to flood the moon's orbital region with lots of satellites, so half a dozen people can know their way around. There's a sort of economic uh, factor and a strong sustainability factor here as well uh, about um, you know how we treat the moon if we are going to become a spacefaring species. Um, I might just add, th throw in one other comment though as well. The 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 picture that you're painting about a moon with an independent time system and uh, it, that it kind of independence from the Earth. Um, at the moment, we anybody on the moon has no independence from Earth whatsoever. And if you're going to build a self-sustainable uh, community there, however big it is, then there's huge amounts of work that need uh, need to be done to make that self-sustainable. And in fact, time keeping time keeping is part of that but it is quite a small part. There's lots of other big problems as well. <laughs> okay. I think timekeeping actually is probably the easiest one to solve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but when I'm thinking about, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm migrating to the moon, it's my new yep, home. Good, good. We'll as, I'm, as I'm passing through the array of, you know, uh, orbiting 
satellites that are forming the GPS and the communication yes. sort of base for yeah. the moon. At what point do I enter the lunar time zone from the Earth time zone? <laughs> I, I think that's not so much a technical question, it's a cultural question. Mm. It's a bit like taking a flight to another country. Exactly. Yeah. At what point do you adjust your watch to, the, to your destination mm. time zone? A whole bunch of systems to interact needs to need to know the difference between those two and and make sure that you uh, you understand where you are in in that spectrum. But in terms of the traveller, they get to set their watch on arrival. I think almost. I always set it <laughs> more or less when I leave. Okay. Because you want to um, reaccustom your body to the yes. new time zone. Um, and that might be what you do on the moon as well. As soon as you get in the spacecraft, you say, right, folks, you're on lunar time now. Forget about everything else. Mm -hmm. You're on your way. And I can imagine a future where, you know, the moon, if, if we imagine what's being proposed, which is the moon ultimately becomes the base for further space exploration mm -hmm. and possible settlement on planets like Mars, that that total um, independence from the Earth and the, the yes. ability for it to have its complete complete control over what's happening there and all of its communications and all of that. But of course, then when we aspire to take human beings to Mars and to settle there, if settlement is what we end up being able to do, of course, we're doing the whole thing again, but it's going to be really different. So just speculatively, probably we haven't uh, worked this out yet, but you might have done some thinking. What's time going to be like on Mars when we get there? Well much the same as it is here. It's much more similar to the Earth in terms of time than the Moon is. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> uh, so yes, that is. So you, but you know, there are other jolly aspects to it as well, like your, your weight being only a third of what it is on Earth. So that gives you a bit of a lively way of getting around the surface. But the fact, that, the fact is that um, one uh, noon to the next on Mars is 24 hours and 40 minutes. It's very, very similar mm, to what not. we have on Earth. And so it will be much easier on Mars to have a natural set of time zones, uh, which probably would relate directly to Earth. You still have to, you're still faced with that problem of, of setting the, the, the passage of time somehow with some, probably a single atomic clock to start mm -hmm. with rather than a, a, you know, a confederation of them like we have on Earth. Uh, but, it, but I think it will be a, an easier problem. Uh, and, and in fact, there's, there's already pre um, a sort of precedent for that because the, the, the rovers that are on Mars, and there are two of them, three actually, very active. Oh, I think one of them has given up. That's the Chinese one. But uh, Perseverance and Curiosity on Mars, um, they are operated on Mars time, absolutely on Mars time, so that everybody knows what time sunrise is and sunset is. And these are important aspects of daily life. I think, and and I haven't thought as much about what timekeeping would be like. I think, again, one of the big differences is, is just that you're further away and that it plays out a little bit technologically. So the round trip time is bigger. You have to be more independent. You, mm. you can't rely really on synchronization remotely from Earth any, any longer. You have to be self-sustaining. Um, but I think also that changes how you feel because you are again a long way away from Earth. Even on the Moon, the Earth is in the sky. It, um, You're on the right side of the Moon. <laughs> if, if, correct. <laughs> but I, I just think that's the biggest shift. It's it's you're a l much long, much further away, and that that affects how you feel as well as how time plays out in in technically in the environment. It's so fascinating the picture that you've helped us paint today around how our future as a species might be yeah, different, yeah. the way we relate to technology and the way that the very process of travelling into space and through space alters the way we experience time and both culturally and, and physically as well, I know. So that's all we have time for today. But I want to say a big thank you to our special guests, uh, Bruce Warrington and Fred Watson. It's been an absolute delight to have you both here at Questacon. Thank and you. for those of us in our audience who'd like to know a bit more about lunar horology, uh, space travel, <laughs> and what time and other things it is on the moon, please check out the Questacon website at questacon.edu.au. Thank you, and we'll see you at Questacon soon.